There we go. All right. Got it. Cool. All right. How do we get rid of all this stuff? Oh, no, I don't want that. There we go. Can I make this go away? I don't know how. All right. So we'll just get started now. Um, okay. So folks want to go over three and five. So what is that? Um, chapter 15. Um, all right. So do you want to do chapter 14? So just uh, to recall here, uh, midterm two covers, unfortunately, three chapters, but it's just the last part of chapter 14, uh, which is mechanisms and catalysis. Right, so we talked about little k in um, chapter 14, and then chapter 15 and 16 involve uh, big K equilibrium constant and um, uh, and uh, acid base uh, uh, chemistry. So uh, solutions in um, acid bases and aqueous solution, we calculated pH. Okay, so um, to see. Um, Let's just do chapter 14. I want to just do chapter 14. All right. Uh, let's just get it out of the way because it's the little bit that's uh, left over. Okay. So uh, chapter 14, the only parts that are assessed are mechanisms and um, catalysis, right? So mechanisms, the idea, and this kind of uh, catapults us into chemical equilibria uh, because uh, the idea of a fast equilibrium is something we take advantage of um, when we are doing a mechanism where the slow step isn't the first step. So um, let's do, let's just do the first one here. Let's identify a catalyst or intermediates if there are any in this reaction. So how we want to approach this question is get the overall reaction by adding the two together and canceling things out. But we got to be careful of uh, noticing how we cancel things out. So uh, just yell out what what cancels out of this reaction when we when we add them up. CLO, yes. Okay. Anything else? I already said CLO. CL cancels. Anything else? Nope, that's everything. All right, so when we cancel those two substances out, we get O3 combines with an oxygen atom to give two O2 molecules. So we see that's a fine and dandy balanced equation. So we canceled two different species out of this uh, uh, equation, but differently, right? So Cl, the atom, chlorine atom, how did we cancel that out? It was a reactant and then a product. So if you think about it, use your language here, uh, chlorine atom is consumed and then it's produced in the reaction, in this two-step mechanism. So what would CL be then, a catalyst or an intermediate? It would be a catalyst. Um, then CLO would be what? That's our intermediate because it's made in the middle, all right, uh, like in the middle of the reaction, um, and then it is produced at the end. Right. And so, you know, um, exam questions may be it might just give like a bunch of substances. It'll say CL, CLO, O and O3. Identify what these are. Is it a catalyst? Is it an intermediate or is it neither? Meaning, is it a reactant or product in the actual reaction? So we already said CLO is a catalyst. But what about O3? What is O3? It is a reactant, and that's kind of tricky because look, Cl and O3 are both reactants in that first reaction, but when we look at it um, macroscopically and see, oh, Cl is consumed and then produced at the end of the reaction, it makes it a catalyst, even though both are reactants in, the first, um, in that first equation. So do be um, aware of that. So O3 is a reactant or in like a, an exam, you would say neither. I don't even know how to spell that, neither. Okay, there we go. All right, so that's that one. Okay, ozone again. So here we have a two-step mechanism, but in the absence of a catalyst. So let's first write the overall chemical equation that's happening. So same idea here. Add up these two equations and see what cancels out. What cancels out? Scream it out. Oxygen what? Atom, just O atom. Note. I say O atom versus oxygen because typically we think of that as O2. So it's O atom cancels out. So we see that this reaction adds up to two ozones combined gas to give three oxygen molecules, diatomic oxygens. And we see that is in fact 
balanced, so that would make O in this case an intermediate. Okay, so let's derive a rate law that is consistent with this um, uh, mechanism. So, um, oh crap, my key is wrong. Did I do C? No, I didn't. Um, I'm just going to say don't worry about C. I was trying to be clever. Uh, don't worry about C. Don't worry about it. Uh, because here's the thing, you have to predict whether this reaction is endo or exothermic. Um, but it's not super clear. This reaction is, in fact, what is it? It is. Um, Oh, wait, no, it is exothermic. But um, regardless, let, let's um, do A and B. See, this is what happens when you write your own questions and you don't have it vetted by anyone else except your, yourself. Um, so anyway, we did A, we got the overall chemical equation where ozone is breaking down into oxygen. Um, and so derive the rate law that is consistent with this mechanism. So when we do mechanisms, we look for the rate limiting step. What is our rate limiting step? The first step or the second step? second because I literally am telling you that it's the slow step. So what we do with the rate limiting step is recognize that the reactants in that rate limiting step is what dictates our rate law. So rate of that second step is equal to K. I'm gonna call this K2 because it's the second step, but in the end, all the Ks combine. So don't really worry about um, collecting and keeping track of your Ks. What really matters are the concentrations. So we have oxygen atom and O3. So are we done? We just done? No, what's the problem? We have an intermediate and that's not allowed. Because if we think about it, are we allowed to ever, in our balanced chemical reaction, do we ever add O intermediate to it? No, we never add it. It's always made in situ in the middle of the reaction. So we need to get rid of it. And so the trick is treating the first reaction as an equilibrium. So let's just, you know, since we're going to talk about equilibrium here in a little bit, um, the definition of equilibrium, when a reaction is at equilibrium, the rate of the forward direction is equal to the rate of the reverse direction, right? How I like to uh, 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 um, give an analogy, it's like if you, um, uh, you use a uh, treadmill, all right? It's how I imagine people use treadmills, right? Where you walk at a forward pace, and when you're properly using a treadmill, the fo you, you set your forward pace, your walking pace, equal to the pace that you set your treadmill, right? So you're walking forward, but the treadmill is working in reverse, right? And so if you're someone like creeping on someone using the treadmill, and if that person on the treadmill achieves equilibrium, a person watching won't see that person move. They'll just kind of stay there, stay put, all right? And so that's the idea of equilibrium. The forward rate is equal to the reverse rate. And I'll bring that treadmill analogy back up in a, in a second. So we have a forward rate and a reverse rate. Each of those have a rate law uh, specific to the concentrations of stuff that's um, there. So the forward rate is dependent on the concentrations of the reactants in that uh, 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 fast equation, right? Where the reverse rate law is dependent on the products of that same reaction. So essentially think of it, you're setting the concentration of products equal to concentration of um, reactants. So K2, or sorry, not K2, it's K negative one or forward, whatever. Um, O2 times O. And so we'll use this relationship to isolate O. O is actually related to the um, ratio of O3 and O2. So if you divide both sides by K1, O2, you get that, um, so both sides by that, um, you get that O, our intermediate, is equal to, I'm just going to combine the Ks and call it K, um, is O3 times O2 concentration. And so this relationship we can replace into our original rate determining step to get that the rate of this overall reaction, again, I'm just gonna call it K overall, is equal to O3 squared, so two O3s, because I'm replacing it, I'm adding an additional O3 to multiply over um, O2 concentration. And that is our overall rate law. Right. So um, question C, I'll talk about it. Uh, 
this question would be a lot easier if I told you that this reaction was um, exothermic. Right, delta H is negative, is a negative sign. Um, the reason I know that this reaction is um, exothermic is that oxygen um, gas is the most stable of our oxygen species. So you can think of this reaction as kind of like a formation reaction um, in reverse. So this reaction is exothermic, but that's not the detail here. What I want you to get at is we need to write a reaction coordinate um, diagram that is consistent with this mechanism. So when we draw our humps, right, how I drew this reaction coordinate di diagram reactants to products, so how many steps is occurring right now? One. So is this reaction mechanism consistent with what's going on here? No, we need to make a reaction mechanism that has two humps, but also we need the first step to be fast and the second step to be slow. So to do that, uh, we, we got to do it a couple ways. So this is an exothermic reaction. But again, that's like a small detail. And I was trying to be clever. This is not really um, uh, what's assessed on this exam. What I want you to understand is that this is a two step mechanism. So we need a fast step. All right, so I'm going to make a little hump right here. And I'm going to really exaggerate it. A little hump. Uh, sm uh, small activation energy for our first step, but then a really large one for our second step. So I really tried to exaggerate it where the first step is fast, but the second step is slow. So this is maybe what um, the reaction coordinate diagram would look like, that there's two steps, two steps, the first step is fast, the second step is slow, and that's what's important here. Okay, all right, uh, different kinds of K for K over, K overall is good enough. K overall is good enough. I mean, you can get the Ks. Uh, K overall, in this case, you combine uh, K1, K2, and K negative 1. So K overall, in this case, is K1 times K2 over K negative 1. But uh, the, in lab, you can never isolate K1, K2, and K negative 1. You only ever measure K overall. That's what you measure in lab. Like when you did the bar lab, or what are you doing this week? You're doing... Yeah, CLK, so reactions at different temperatures, you're just looking at K overall. Even if it's a one-step mechanism or two-step mechanism, you're just measuring K overall. We can't actually isolate the individual Ks. All right, so that's chapter 14, kinetics, mechanisms. For mechanisms, the slow step is the rate determining step. So if the first step, let's pretend if this first step was um, the rate determining step, let's say it was not fast, slow, it was slow, fast, what would the rate law be? It would just be dependent on O3. And then are you done? Yep, you're done. That's it. That's it. All right. You're just dependent on um, that one reactant. Um, that's if the first step is a slow step. Okay. So let's leave the realm of small k and go to the realm of big k, equilibrium constant. So take my hand, follow me into the dark, and we will talk about big k for I don't know, like two, two more months, All right? So, big K. Um, how, how should we talk about big K? Um, all right, so let's just kind of overview what big K is, just real quick, all right? So let's remind ourselves what equilibrium is. Rate, equilibrium is when the forward rate equals the reverse rate. So let me just do like a generic reaction. A plus B equilibrium C. That's my reaction, all right? So when this reaction achieves equilibrium, what it means is that the rate of A and B being consumed is the same rate as C being uh, C being consumed in the other direction. So what we see is no net change. So just like in mechanisms, we can say that the rate for the forward reaction, so K forward, this is small k rate constant, times A concentration times B concentration is equal to the uh, rate constant of the reverse direction times C concentration. So this is no different than me, you know, taking a fast step from a mechanism setting uh, the products equal to the reactants, right? But this is how we get big K. It's this relationship. I think a lot of students, we rely on the fact that we go like, oh yeah, big K is products over reactants, okay? But this is where that comes from because what we're going to do is rearrange this. We're going to divide both sides by A times B on one side, 
okay, A times B. So this all cancels, and then we are gonna divide both sides by K reverse, all right, K reverse. So then this cancels. So what we get is that the ratio of the rate constant in the forward direction is equal, or sorry, over the rate constant in the reverse direction, sorry, those are small k's, is equal to the ratio of the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. Both of these equalities, both of these things are equal to Kc, equilibrium constant, big K, both of them. So the idea here is, yes, Kc is products over reactants. So if I have an exothermic reaction, all right, uh, if I ask you what's more stable in an exothermic reaction, reactants or products, what's more stable? Products. So at equilibrium, what are you going to see more of? at equilibrium products because those are the more stable things so what can we deduce about the value of k is it going to be a big value or a small value if you see a lot of c a lot of product at equilibrium it's going to be a big value yeah because you have a lot of products but what does that also mean about this reaction if c is a big number which one of these rate constants is also a big number the forward direction or the reverse direction forward the forward direction is faster than the reverse direction now look at this reaction coordinate diagram right compare the activation energies which one has the larger activation energy the forward direction or the reverse reverse so does that mean the reverse is fast or slow slow so that means the reverse reaction has a small k versus the forward direction i'm really exaggerating it here has a really big K because activation energy is really, really uh, large. Or sorry, activation energy is small, so the forward direction is very large. So that's consistent with, oh, I have a big number in the numerator, a small number in the denominator. The rate constant for the forward direction is faster or larger than the rate constant for the reverse. And that's how we're able to get that. And both of those are consistent with a large value of K for this exothermic reaction. You're going to see a lot of product at equilibrium um is 17 uh did i get my numbers wrong uh so 14 i thought 14.5 was uh mechanisms i was under the impression as mechanisms and uh, catalysis are on midterm two i might the, are you using the right numbers i didn't know there was a seven 14.7 okay can you only use a reverse k in mechanism when it's in equilibrium i'm not sure what that means um okay all right so that's overviewing um rate constant or sorry uh, how rate constant is related to equilibrium constant so remember the equilibrium concentrations of products over reactants also tell us the relative amounts um, or magnitudes of your rate constant and it's consistent with your reaction coordinate diagram within here okay so but I would say like 80% of the time we use the products over reactants K value. So in this example, I'm giving you K. I tell you K is 3.93. And I tell you your system at equilibrium has this concentration of CO, this concentration of H2, this concentration of water, All right? And now I'm asking you what is uh, methane at equilibrium, All right? So, Kind of the first step here is always, if you're given a chemical equilibrium, just go ahead and write the K expression. So it's always gonna be products over reactants. Since this is Kc, it's probably makes sense for us to put this in concentration, molarity. So products, uh, a methane concentration is equal to water times water concentration over hydrogen concentration, but it has to be cubed, and then um, CO concentration. All right, that's our KC expression. I tell you that this ratio is about four. All right, so the tricky thing with equilibrium, like yes, you guys all learned about ice tables and you're real good at ice tables now, but you don't always have to use an ice table. What does ice stand for? Initial change equilibrium. So you only have to use an ice table if you're given initial concentrations and you have to figure out how does the reaction have to change in order to achieve equilibrium. This question, read it carefully. I give you what kind of concentrations? 
equilibrium. So I'm literally telling you the equilibrium line already. So what this means is that these concentrations go straight into our K expression. I do not need to use an ice table. Don't try to use do an ice table because these are already at equilibrium. So they go into the K expression. So literally all we have to do is do 3.93. Uh, we're solving for methane concentration, and then we just put in those concentrations that are given 0 0.0478 over uh, hydrogen, so 0 0.1566. But what is this? This whole thing needs to be cubed, yes, uh, because of that three in um, the reaction, and then CO is given 0 0.1522. So you can solve that. I'm not going to solve it. All right. So just Solve for um, methane and how to check yourself. Once you get methane, put all those values back into the K expression and make sure that you get uh, a KC of four to check yourself, all right? All right, uh, in the supplemental lecture videos, uh, catalysis is 14.7, yes. Um, so I was aware of this. So there was a change in um, additions and they changed the numbers around, but the videos, the supplemental lecture videos, um, uh, I guess the numbers weren't updated. So in the new book, catalysis is 14.6. Thank you, Kyle. All right. So KC, what does C stand for? Concentration. In KP, what does P stand for? Pressure. In KW, what does W stand for? Water. In KA, what does A stand for? Acid. KB, what does B stand for? Base. So all of this should guide you and what you what kind of reaction you write. So here, what is the value of Kp for this um, uh, for this reaction at this temperature? So I give you Kc. Um, so if you look at the very end of this packet, see I'm nice now. I gave you. I copied the supplemental information. And I just put it at the back of this packet. So if you look at this packet, we give you very, very little. The basically the only equation we give you is this KP expression, uh, where KP is equal to KC RT delta M. So I'm asking what is KP? All right, so this is a different equilibrium value. If we consider these gases in their in terms of their pressure, it's going to be a different value versus we can talk about gases in terms of their molarity as well. Um, and so these two are related to each other by a factor of RT. Delta N is how the moles of gas change in this reaction, right? So to calculate delta N for a chemical equilibrium, all you have to do is look at the values, or sorry, look at the balanced equation, count how many moles of gas are on the reactant side. Tell me. Four, how many moles of gas are on the product side? Two. So as we move in the forward direction, we go from four moles of gas to two moles of gas. So we lose two moles of gas. So delta N is always the number of moles of gas in the products minus reactants. That's the convention. Products minus reactants. So delta N in this case is negative two. But if you want to think about what that means, it means when you move in the forward direction, you lose two moles of gas. All right. So that's delta N. So all we have to do is plug everything in. So KP is equal to the KC that's given for a uh, three point something, nine three times R, which R should we use? If this is P, pressure, we should use the, um, the atmosphere one. So 0 0.08206 liter ATM mole Kelvin. That's the K, uh, sorry, the R we should use times temperature, this temperature should be in Kelvin, so this is 1200 Kelvin. Um, and then to the negative, um, sorry, to the delta N, so in this case it's negative two, all right? And then that will give you KP. So KP is a different value if you work um, these gases in pressures instead. Okay, all right, let's keep going. Um, here, uh, in number four, um, I'll just go through this quickly. So we have reactions one and two. We add them together and the result is reaction three. So if you look at this, if you add these together, all right, I'm telling you that the K 
for the first reaction is 4.5 times 10 to the negative four. So I'll call that K1. K2 for the second reaction is, what did I say? One times 10 to the 14. All right, and I'm asking, what is this new K for reaction number three, All right? So when we manipulate K expressions, it's kind of like Hess's law, right? If you flip a reaction, K changes because you change the equilibrium. But instead of uh, taking K to the uh, multiplying by negative one, like we did in Hess's law, what we do is actually we wanna flip the K value. So take it to the negative one exponent. So an example I like to show is, okay, this is an equilibrium. What is the KC expression for this reaction? What is it? B over A, thank you. Thank you for being brave. So B over A, those are concentrations. Now let's flip the reaction. What is the K expression for this? A over B. So see how if we flip the reaction, we actually flip a fraction. So to do that, we take it to the negative one exponent. So let me do it uh, differently. So if we take A, B, and instead of inspecting AB, what if it was 2A goes to 2B? What is the KC expression here? B squared over A squared, concentrations, right? So here, if we multiply a reaction by 2, we don't uh, multiply K by 2, we actually square it. Because remember, stoichiometry becomes exponents. So that's our idea. Um, uh, our strategy here just use the same skills from Hess's law how you manipulated reactions flipped them you know canceled things to get your target reaction but how we combine our k's are different we don't add them we multiply them together and we take things to the exponent right so that's the general concept so in these two reactions when we um combine these it looks like what are what are we doing um when we combine these two reactions it looks like um, H3O plus cancels. It looks like uh, one of the waters cancel. So it looks like we're taking a nitrous acid hydroxide. So we're just adding these reactions exactly as is. So if we add reactions one and two, what do we do to K1 and K2 to get the overall K? We just multiply them. Yeah, so we multiply them together. So literally all we do is multiply those numbers together. And then you got your answer. So, whoops. Uh, so K3 in this case is equal to K1 times K2 because all we do is just add them together. If we had to do any manipulations like flipping and stuff, we would have to use those exponents. Okay. All right. So that's four. Let's keep going. Five. Yes. All right. Now it's ice table time. Maybe. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have 0.5 moles, molarity of A placed in a container, and A decomposes according to this reaction. At equilibrium, the concentration of B is that. Calculate Kc at this temperature. Okay, I like to define, there's two types of ice tables. There's an ice table where sometimes you have to use the quadratic, okay? And then there's ice tables where you don't ever. And so in this example, I'm giving you initial concentrations. I'm giving you a hint at the equilibrium line and you're calculating uh, Kc or K in this, whatever, K in this case. So for question five, you never have to use the approximation ever. If you approximate, what do I say in class? Anyone here in my class? If you approximate on this question, you are just being lazy because you, I have enough information in this question to calculate X, you just gotta plug X in, All right? So I'll show you how this is done. So it is an ice table. Remind me, what does ice stand for? Initial change equilibrium. So 0.5 molarity A is gonna go in which line? It's gonna go in initial because you place it in the reaction first or in the vessel first and then it does something. So this is before the reaction happens. So I'm gonna put 0.5 molarity in for A initially. And so um, just of note, I'm calculating Kc, so concentration. So what should the unit in this ice table be? Molarity. What if I was working, what if I wanted to calculate Kp? What is the most logical unit to work in? Pressures, yes. So in this case, since everything is, uh, we wanna calculate Kc, we wanna use um, molarity. So 
if I have 0.5 molarity of A, I have zero of B and C. So I always ask, which way does this reaction have to go? Forward. So in the change line, what's the change line? Minus 2x. Why is it 2x? The coefficient, very good. And then it's plus x plus x for B and C. So at equilibrium, we have 0.5 minus 2x, x, x. All right. All right, so um, what we didn't do is we didn't just get that we didn't get the KC expression, but we can go ahead and do that. Uh, KC is going to be products over reactants, so B times C over A concentration, but that is squared, right? And so once we have our ice table, what, how do we how do we move on to the next step? The E line always goes into the K expression. Remember, K represents equilibrium concentrations. These are the concentrations at equilibrium, right? So that is our next step, that we want to plug all of those uh, values of the equilibrium line into the K expression. But the problem is, is that these aren't really numbers yet, that they're Xs. So let's use that last piece of information in uh, this equation that I tell you that at equilibrium, so this value, whatever I'm about to read, is going to is related to which line? I, C, or E? E, yeah. So this is the B concentration at equilibrium. So this number, 0 .05, um, 0 0.065, is equal to this value. We said in this ice table that B, we gain an X amount of B. I'm literally telling you that at equilibrium, we have 0 0.065 moles of B present. Sorry, molarity of B. So I'm telling you what X is. So that means if 0 0.065 molarity is equal to X, how much A do I also have at equilibrium based upon this table? It's the same value, 0 0.065 molarity of X uh, of A as well. All right. Can we use this information to figure out how much A we have as well? Yeah, we can. Since we know what X is, all we have to do is plug in uh, 2X 0 0.065, whatever that is. Don't have my key. My key. Boop, 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 boop. X is given B A. Yeah. Okay. So A concentration is equal to um, 0 0.37 molarity, all right? So these are the equilibrium concentrations. This is the concentration of A, there is the concentration of B, and there is the concentration of C. So all those pink circles, can I put those into the equilibrium expression? Yes, because those are equilibrium concentrations. So our KC is equal to um, what is it? Uh, 0 0.65, or sorry, 0 0.065 squared over uh, 0 0.37 molarity, A, or whatever. And then that's your answer, all right? So notice here, um, let me um, uh, write this a little bit differently. KC equals, let me just take the X values x squared over 0 0.5 minus 2x. So I'm assuming most of you, um, you know, you're learning about weak acids and weak bases. And when we calculate pH, we almost always, do we ever do the quadratic when we're doing like weak acids, weak bases? No, almost never. We almost always approximate. What's the approximation we use? We just say that that minus X is really small. So the idea here is, well, why don't we just do that? Why can't we approximate that minus two X is really small and just assume that the value is really small. So the idea here is if you do this, literally we know what X is, just plug it in. Yeah. Uh, what would be squared? Oh yeah, uh, sorry, yes, it is squared. Yes, that is squared. Good, yes, it is also squared. This is squared. But what I want to do here, make that squared. Okay, cool. Um, what a lot of students will try to do is get rid of this minus 2x or this minus x because that's oftentimes what we do. But the thing is, we know what x is, so there's no need to approximate. The only reason we approximate is to avoid doing what? The quadratic formula. Does this require the quadratic formula? 
No, this is just algebra. So you do not need to, um, uh, uh, you don't need to um, uh, approximate at all. You can literally just calculate what the equilibrium concentration is because we have X. And this is a common mistake that I see or, or I wouldn't be standing on the soapbox yelling at you <laughs> to not be lazy. In this case, where I give you I line, I give you part of the E line, and that allows you to fill in the rest of your ice table to then calculate C. The next question is different. So do not approximate on this question where we are calculating K. In the next question, we're not calculating K. I give you K and I'm asking you to calculate equilibrium concentrations. Here in these types of questions, we often do have to approximate. Sometimes, sometimes we can be sneaky. We can be sneaky. Uh, so let's see what we can do in this um, question. So calculate the equilibrium pressures of all the species that results in the decomposition of H2S with initial concentration of that. Let me copy this. It's over here, I'm gonna copy that. All right, so we're gonna do an ice table again because this is, I, I gave you initial concentration so that we have to do an ice table and we are trying to calculate uh, equilibrium concentrations. So this may or may not um, require an ice table. So I tell you that H2S has an initial pressure of 1.8 ATM. So since we're working in pressure, does it make sense that I give you a KP? Yes. Do I have to do any converting? No, we can just stick with pressures here. So 1.8 goes right here, 1.8 ATM. Boom. How much product do I have initially? Nothing. This reaction must go in what direction? Forward. It's minus what? 2x plus 2x plus plus x. Perfect. So um, you add up those two lines, so we get 1.8 minus 2x is how much H2S I have at equilibrium. At equilibrium, I have 2x amount of hydrogen gas, and I have x amount of sulfur gas, right? And so now this is where we can utilize the KP expression. Since I give you that value, it's products over reactants, so H2 concentration over S2 concent sorry, times S2 concentration, H2 squared. Div uh, divided by the product concentration squared. So we have the equilibrium line. We put it into the K expression with all those X's and all of that. So I get that hydrogen concentration is 2X squared times X over 1.8 minus 2X squared. Crap, what's the answer? All right, okay. So um, here we can, uh, we know what K is. K is given to us, but I'm gonna um, kind of simplify this a little bit more. I'm gonna distribute that square. So this is four X squared times X. So that is actually four X cubed. Do you agree on the top? Okay, and then on the bottom, so what you might wanna try to do is distribute that square. But do you want to do that? No. Do you want to approximate? Yeah. So why can we approximate? So K, KP, all right, is really what? It is really small, all right? So if K is really small, what's mostly present at equilibrium? Reactants. So if we start with mostly reactants, will the reaction go forward that much? No. This minus 2x and the plus x's, these are going to be really, really small numbers compared to the 1.8 that we're subtracting it from. 1.8 is a pretty big number. So if minus x is a really small number, we can make an approximation that makes this easier on us. If we recognize, okay, k is a really small number, so minus 2x is a really small number. So if I take 1.8 and subtract a really small number, does 1.8 change that much? No, it doesn't. So my approximation that I can make is that that whole denominator is actually just 1.8 squared. But if you wanna solve the whole thing on your calculator, go ahead, all right? But the idea here is that in, on our exams, 
you can always solve it with an approximation to avoid using the uh, quadratic formula that we don't make it so you have to use the quadratic formula to get the answer um, right that the tolerances on our um, you know answers if it's numerical will always uh, uh, work with the approximation or if it's multiple choice if your answer is like close enough it's all, if it only differs in the very last sig fig you know you're going to choose that answer anyway so um, that's the idea here that why the approximation works but what i always like to do is um, solve things with wolfram alpha to just check okay with the approximation does it work and then compare it to the value with without the approximation and that's what i typically do um, so this is a lot easier to solve. So 4x cubed over 1.8 squared equals that 2.2 times 10 to the negative 6, right? And so that you can absolutely solve. So um, I think you get if you multiply both sides by um, that 1.8 squared, you get that 4x cubed equals, um, oh, I didn't do it. My key doesn't have it. If X is so minuscule, why do we still consider it in the numerator? Because in for the numerator, X is the only thing that's there. So the reason, it's not just that the X is small in the denominator, we can get rid of it. The actual reason why we can get rid of it is because we're subtracting it from such a big number. But in the numerator, X is the only thing that's there. So let's go ahead and solve for this. So, um, 1.8 squared times 2.2 e to the negative 6 equals 7.128 times 10 to the negative 6. So divide both sides by 4. We get x cubed equals 1.78 times 10 to the negative 6. And then uh, how do we undo a cube? Cube root. But do you want to take the time to find that on your calculator? Probably not. What's the other way to get rid of a cube? times it by, or not times it, but uh, take it to the one third exponent. Yes, so if you do 1.78 times 10 to the negative six, caret one third, okay, you might be giggling like, yeah, there's, I bet there's people in here who do not know that, all right? If you caret to the one third, it's the same thing as the cube root, because I don't know, I don't want to take the time to find where the cube root is on my calculator. So uh, taking it to the one third is the same thing. Right, there was a question over here. Five percent. Yeah, but obviously on the exam, you're not going to know that. Um, and but that's the general rule if that your answer if this if this thing you're subtracting is more than 5% of the original thing, then you probably should not approximate. Um, but I think I have I'm not sure if I have. Um, yeah, I do have the approximation and the not approximation in here and you essentially get the same number. It just varies in the very last sig fig, but in the course of, you know, a multiple choice exam, they're essentially the same answer. All right. So uh, that's how we get X. All right, and so we get X, I think when you use the approximation is 0 0.0121 molarity, or no, what we're doing pressure, so ATM, all right, is that my answer? No, we got to look back at the question and see what it's asking. Yes, we calculated X, good job, pat yourself on the back, but now let's take that X and put it into the ice table and calculate what the question is actually asking. And it's asking, what is the equilibrium concentrations of everything? So that means we need to take that X that we just calculated, X equals 0 0.0121 um, ATM, and use that information in our equilibrium line. So what this means is that at equilibrium, Okay, the amount of S2 I have is equal to X. So it is simply uh, the 0 0.0121 you know, 0 .0 ATM we just calculated. But hydrogen concentration, is that equal to X? Nope, it's 2X. So what we should measure for hydrogen concentration is twice the pressure of sulfur. So it's gonna be 2X. So it's gonna be whatever that number is. And then finally, uh, we can um, do the subtraction of H2S, but we basically see that when you subtract 2x from 1.8, does that value change that much within sig figs? Let's see. So 1.8 minus 2 times 0 0.0121, 
All right, so how this changes. So I actually, it started with 1.80. I forgot that zero. All right, and so what we get when we um, subtract it is that it is 1.78. So it barely changes at all. Barely, barely, barely changes. All right. Okay, so that is using an approximation. Good? All right. It's good when X is small. But never approximate when you calculate K. If I give you I, I give you part of E, never approximate. But you can approximate if to avoid using the quadratic if um, um, something's like this. All right. Um, let me just think of one more example. Um, let me do one more before we do it. So let's say I have 2A goes to, is this what I want to do? Um, B plus C, okay, ice, boom, all right, ice. Okay, let's say that KC is equal to, all of this is aqueous, so I'm just making this up. I'm going to say it's 16, all right? Okay, uh, what do we want my initial concentration to be? What? Someone just tell, say a number. 27, okay. 27 molarity, geez. All right, we have zero of this stuff. I think this will work. Yeah, I think it'll work. All right, so which way does this reaction have to go? Forward, perfect. So what is the change line? Minus 2x. Next, plus x, plus x. So at equilibrium, we have 27 minus 2x of a. We have x amount of b and x amount of c. All right, so what do we do next? Put the E line into K, all right? The KC expression is six, is the value is 16, but this has an expression. It's B concentration times C concentration over A concentration, but it is squared. So when now we put these equilibrium concentrations into KC, all right, so that means at equilibrium, since I give you, Casey, that this is 16, our goal is to solve for X. We're trying to solve for equilibrium concentration. So what is this uh, reduced down to? X squared over 27 minus 2 uh, X, but that whole thing is squared because A, A is squared, all right? This is equal to 16. Should we approximate here? No, do you wanna be sneaky? Yes, let's be sneaky. So how we can avoid using the quadratic, uh, what a lot of students will try to do is uh, distribute that square. Don't do that. Can we subtract this 2x? You might want to try to, but here's the thing. K, is that a small number? No, it's not. It's actually a, kind of a fairly large number. So we make a fair amount of product at uh, equilibrium. But you might think, oh, um, you know, uh, this value is pretty large, but here's the thing, we can be sneaky and not even use the quadratic at all, because if you look very carefully, what can we do? Square root both sides, yeah. So if we square root both sides, this reduces down to x over 27 minus 2x equals 4. Does that require the quadratic? No, that just requires algebra that I don't feel like doing right now. But you can move things around and you can solve for x pretty simply on your calculator. This is a, this is a perfect square uh, example where we can avoid using the quadratic at all, as long as you recognize we have a square over a square, and if you square root both sides, you can get rid of it. You cannot approximate on this, all right? Minus 2x is going to be too large. K of 16 is pretty big. You're gonna make a lot of product, all right? Okay, all right, good, all right, so more. All right, consider this reaction at equilibrium. It's an elementary step. So what kind of reaction is this? Endothermic. So that means heat is a what? If I, if I hold an endothermic reaction, what does it feel like to you? Cold. So the reaction is doing what? Releasing heat or absorbing heat? Absorbing heat, heat. it's taking it from you. So you can think of triangle as a reactant. Okay, because it's it's like taking heat from you. So let's pretend we remove some um, CO2 from this reaction, All right? So this is um, Le Chatelier's principle, but with concepts. You have to understand why does the reaction shift? 
and it has to do with the rate laws. So let's just uh, use Le Chatelier's principle really quick. So if I remove CO2, I'm removing a reactant, what's gonna happen? How does the reaction shift to reestablish equilibrium? Is it gonna go forward or is it gonna go backwards? Backwards, but we wanna understand why. Okay, there's a reason why. So the moment we um, remove CO2, if you just think, oh, K is equal to products over reactants, the moment we, we remove CO2, what um, uh, value are we changing? The numerator or the denominator? Denominator, because CO2 is a reactant. So this number on the denominator gets smaller. Right, the moment we disturb K. So that means when we predict the value of Q, if we make the value in the bottom here smaller, overall, this ratio becomes what kind of number? A bigger number or a smaller number? Bigger. So that means Q is now larger than K the moment we make that disturbance. All right. And I like to think of it this way. Q is the unstable conditions. It's the ratio of products over reactants when things are unstable. K is what the reaction wants to be. So if at this moment, Q, the, the conditions, Q is too big, I have too much products. So the reaction's going to move in which way to establish equilibrium if I have too much product? It's gonna move in the reverse direction. And that's exactly what we, what we see. So Q is larger than K at this moment. So the reaction shifts in this direction to reestablish, reestablish, Right. Oh, yeah, that's this, this question. Number two is shifts in that reason, uh, that direction. Right. So, yes, the reaction goes in the reverse direction. But why? Is it because the reverse direction speeds up? Is it because the forward direction slows down? And so uh, let's talk about my um, treadmill anal analogy. When a reaction's at equilibrium, rate of the forward equals rate of the reverse. So in this um, reaction, the forward rate constant times CO2 concentration squared is equal to the reverse rate constant times CO concentration squared times O2 concentration. All right, that is our rate law for the forward and reverse direction. That is true when we're at equilibrium. Forward rate equals reverse rate. So now let's go back to our treadmill analogy. Okay, when someone has reached equilibrium on a treadmill, do they move? Are they moving? Are, is there any net movement you see? No, but are they walking? Yes, they are. Okay, perfect. Okay, there are two ways a person can go flying off the back of a treadmill, meaning, meaning that you've disrupted the equilibrium, all right? Two ways that a person can go flying off the back of the treadmill. Name one. What's one way a person can go flying off the back? if they stop walking, right? If they stop walking and the treadmill's still going, they'll fly off, right? Is there another way? If you speed up the treadmill, if someone comes in and hits, you know, speed up, but they keep walking at the same pace, they will also fly off. So see how there's two ways that can net the same observation. Just like in this uh, example, there's two ways we can net a um, shift to the uh, reactant side. So the idea here is what a lot of students will say. They'll correctly uh, deduce that, okay, if I remove reactant, reaction moves in reverse. But they will incorrectly say it's because the reverse direction speeds up. That's incorrect. That's incorrect. The reason this reaction shifts in the uh, backwards direction is because of the rate laws. What are we, how are we changing this reaction? What, what's the disruption? We're removing CO2. So if we look at the rate laws, is there something in here that's changing? What? CO2. Yeah, CO2 concentration. This value is changing how? It's going down. So that means how is the rate of the forward direction changing? It's getting smaller, all right? So the forward rate is slowing down. And so forward rate is decreasing. But how does the reverse rate change? It stays the same because are we changing any of the concentrations of the products? No, we're not. 
or not, so it remains the same. So note here that here's another way we can get a shift. It's where the forward slows down, but the reverse direction stays the same pace. So overall, we see a shift to the reactant side, all right? Um, so that's a small detail where we use um, uh, rate laws, okay? 5% uh, when approximating, yeah. Uh, so that's like for online homework. Again, for the exam, you can, oh, if you can approximate, you can approximate that it always falls within the 5% rule. We never force someone to use a, the quadratic formula, right? So it's when minus X is less than 5% of the value you're um, uh, subtracting it from. That's what you wanna look for, less than that. You wanna change that value less than 5%. That's the idea. Okay, so uh, let's look back at this question and think, okay, let's heat this reaction up. Let's heat it up. Let's heat it up from, um, what is it? Uh, heat it up to 800 Kelvin. So it was at a lower temperature, now it's um, up to 800 Kelvin. So let's just uh, do the quick and dirty way and use Le Chatelier's principle and treat heat as a product or reactant to predict which way the reaction shifts. So if we heat this reaction up, we're adding heat. Heat is a what in this reaction, reactant. So just using basic Le Chatelier's principle, this reaction should shift to what direction? Forward, okay? But when we heat something up, or when we heat an equilibrium up, um, there's a shift, not because heat is a reactant, but we're actually changing the value of K. We're changing the value of K. So if we're making more product, K is actually becoming what? A bigger number or a smaller number? Bigger number. Remember, um, at least for my class, I yell at you all the time. Uh, uh, what do I say? P does pH plus pOH always equal 14? No. What is the caveat? We can only use that when what? 25 degrees. Because 14 is negative log at K of Kw. But Kw is only 1 times 10 to the negative 14 when? At 25 degrees Celsius. So if we're at any other value other than 25 degrees Celsius, can we use K, uh, pH plus pOH equals 14? No, we can't because Kw changes. K, equilibrium constant, is temperature dependent. So when we change the temperature, we literally change the value of K. And that's why we see a shift. But if we just treat as, uh, heat as a product or reactant, we can predict the shift. But again, I want you to understand it's for a different reason. It's because we're changing the value of K. When we change concentrations and stuff, we're never changing K. We're just making Q conditions and thinking, how do we get back to K? But when we uh, heat a reaction up, we actually do uh, change K. All right. Okay, so we wanted to do equal, um, acid, uh, sorry, acid based stuff. Okay, so um, let's skip eight, let's do nine. That's what people asked for. All right, so Arrhenius acids and bases, those are the simplest kinds of acids and bases in that they were just based upon observations. All right, uh, uh, Arrhenius acids, they are just substances that make, so this is Arrhenius. They make H plus in solution. They make H plus, acid, boom. And Arrhenius base doesn't make H plus, it makes hydroxide. So this definition is very broad. Uh, or it, it's, it actually, no, it's a little too specific, all right? H, just H plus, OH minus. Um, so we've expanded our definition to um, bronson lori acid base chemistry and Lewis acid base chemistry, where we're still identifying acids as acids. We're just thinking about it differently. bronson lori acids and bases, what we want to inspect are protons. So H plus, and H plus is a proton. If you look at the like symbol, like what's present in an H plus cation, literally it's all a proton. And when you get to organic chemistry, they will call H plus as protons. Right? So, bronsted lori acids bases look for proton acceptors and proton donors. So, let's just do the definition right now. All right? Bronsted lori acids are what type of proton things? Donors. Yes, they are donors. While bases, bronsted lori bases, do what to protons? They take them, they are uh, proton acceptors. If you ever forget, just look, HCl is a what? What do we call that? 
It's an acid, right? Because the name of HCl is literally hydrochloric acid. Look at this formula, all right? HCl, does HCl look like it's gonna donate a proton or take a proton from something? It's gonna straight up donate one because it has one. It has a hydrogen in it, so it's gonna donate that proton. Acids are proton donors, bases are proton acceptors, all right? So let's look at this reaction and think about what's happening. All right, think about what bonds are being made. So if you look closely, you see ammonia, right? That lone pair on ammonia is taking a hydrogen, a proton from HCl. And then if you look at the products here, see chlorine is now by itself and we made a new bond. That nitrogen, that lone pair is now in this new bond with hydrogen. So we made this new bond, I'll highlight it. That's the new bond that we made right here, boom. So let's define these things. What substance within the reactants is acting as a bronsted lori acid? So what thing is donating the hydrogen, the proton in this reaction? What's giving up the proton? HCl, yeah, so this is our bronsted lori acid. HCl is our bronsted lori acid. So by a process of elimination, that would make ammonia our bronsted lori base. But let's make sure that it fits our definition. Bases accept protons. Okay, they accept protons. Is that what ammonia is doing here? What is it doing? It's stealing, it's straight up stealing a proton from H+. So that makes ammonia a bronsted lori base. But this is just a different way to think about it. Like you should know that HCl is an acid. So it's gonna make sense that it's a bronsted lori acid. Do you already know that ammonia is a base? That was one of the one weak base we asked you to memorize in 1210. Hopefully you should know that ammonia is a base. So it would make sense that it's a bronsted lori base. It's just a different way of thinking about it when we think about how are protons moving in a chemical reaction, all right? Um, let me think of a, uh, I don't feel like doing another example. Okay, let's do, uh, so that's bronsted lori acid spaces. All right, look, I have the same reaction, but this time I want you to identify the Lewis acids and bases. But do you think the answers are gonna change that much? No, ammonia is still gonna be a base. HCl is still gonna be an acid, but we're thinking about it differently. Lewis acids don't look at protons, they look at what? Electrons, all right? So we're looking at electron movement. So we're looking at how are the new bonds being formed, okay? Because uh, bonds are made of two electrons. So uh, let's just get definitions out of the way. Lewis acids do what to um, electrons? They are acceptors, yes, electron acceptors, while bases do what? Electron donors. If ever you forget, if you forget, just do the most simple acid-base reaction, H plus plus OH minus. Remember, OH has all these lone pairs on it, all right? And this makes water, all right? So here's the new bond that's created. All right, think about this. Here's that lone pair on hydroxide. So if you think about what's happening, we're making a bond, right? This is what's happening. A lone pair on hydroxide is making a new chemical bond with um, H+, the acid, to make water. So in this picture, what's donating the electrons? Hydroxide or H+, hydroxide. OH minus is a, obviously a base. All right, so bases are electron donors versus H plus our prototypical acid is doing what? It's accepting those electrons to make that new chemical bond. So here H plus is our electron acceptor. If you ever forget, just draw a generic thing. Just draw a generic thing. Also, you can say this about bronsted lori stuff too, all right? Hydroxide, that's a base. This base is accepting an H plus, so that's a bronsted lori base versus um, this H plus it's donating itself to the bond, to the new substance. So H plus would be a bronsted lori acid because it's donating itself. All right, so let's actually answer this question. So we're thinking about um, protons, all right, or sorry, electrons with Lewis. So there are the electrons. Think about the new bond that's being created. So it's right there. So again, what is donating its electrons? NH3 or HCl, NH3. So this is the electron donor. So that makes ammonia the what? The Lewis base. Yes, Lewis bases donate electrons. 
Okay, ammonia is also a base. So what, what do we see here? That ammonia is the bronsted lori base and the Lewis base, all right? And then that would make HCl the Lewis acid. It is accepting, that H plus is accepting the electrons from the ammonia to then um, uh, make your products. All right, so that is acid bases. Okay. Um, all right. Let's um, identify the conjugates of these things. So the conjugate acid of nitrite. So if we think about it, all right, um, I always like to use HF, all right? HF is the most common weak acid we uh, talk about. But here's the thing, you'll probably rarely interact with HF. The reason we write HF so much is because it's only two letters. And so it's a very easy example to show for weak acid. When HF acts as an acid, it donates a proton because that's what acids do. Then we're left with F minus, all right? So what did we say? HF is a weak acid, wouldn't you agree? F minus that is created in this equilibrium, which is a Ka expression, this is a weak base. Specifically, it's the conjugate base of an acid. So when an acid acts as an acid, it produces the conjugate base on the product side. When a base acts as a base, it makes its conjugate, addicts, uh, uh, conjugate acid on the product side, all right? So if we want to write the conjugate acid of uh, nitrite, all right, uh, this substance is a base. What do bases do in water? What do Lewis, uh, not Lewis, uh, bronsted lori bases do? They do what to protons? Take protons, but where is that base gonna take a proton from? Water, where all these things are in water. So what we're gonna do is take nitrite, add it to water, all right, add it to water. And so when that acts as an acid, it's going to take one of the protons, make hydroxide, because this is a base, and you're gonna produce HNO2. And so the conjugate acid is nitrous acid, HNO2. This is the conjugate acid, because you recognize that NO2, when it acts as a base, uh, uh, accepts, it basically steals a proton from water, all right? So that means, let's just uh, do another conjugate acid, right? Another conjugate acid here. Uh, uh, no, let's not do that, let's just do it in order, okay. So let's write the conjugate base of, um, of uh, carbonic acid, all right? So if we want a conjugate base, we need to recognize that this thing is an acid, write the reaction of that thing acting as an acid. Acids do what to protons? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. A bronsted lori acid is almost always also going to be a Lewis acid. Do you see how both of the definitions, they always are related to one another, right? So it's usually clear. It's usually clear, all right? Like if I ask which is the acid, it doesn't matter whether you use bronsted lori or Lewis acid base theory, you're gonna get the same answer either way, okay? All right, so, um, all right, so if this acid is acting as an acid, it donates a proton and that's how we get its conjugate base. So uh, what is the conjugate base of carbonic acid? We want to do what? Take off a proton, we wanna donate a proton. So once you uh, take off a proton off of carbonic acid, what is left over? HCO3, be careful with charge, minus, because H plus is positive charge. All right, so this substance can then go on and donate another proton, and that's what I want to uh, ask you in part C. What is the conjugate base of HCO3 minus? So this thing is acting as an acid. Take off another proton, all right? Take off another proton, and what do you get? CO3 2 minus. So you might be thinking, oh, this is rather easy, but look, what it, what's this next one? What is the conjugate acid of HCO3 minus? Do I add a proton or remove a proton? 
you add it back in. Yeah, so we gotta be careful here. HCO3 minus, we want this to actually act as a base. So it's going to accept a proton. So we wanna add an H plus to it. So the conjugate acid of bicarbonate is actually HCO3. So we need to be careful of that terminology. We can't just be removing and adding H plus as willy nilly. We need to think about what's happening here in terms of conjugates. I always remind myself by writing out the equation for HF. I always remember, okay, HF is a weak acid. It donates a proton. What's left is its conjugate base F minus versus you can use any generic base, but uh, easy one, and I guess the easiest one would be ammonia. When ammonia acts as a weak base, you add it to water, you get ammonium plus and hydroxide ion um, also. This, so this is ammonium acting as a base. So ammonia is the base, but what substance is the conjugate acid? Ammonium, so there's your conjugate acid. So I like to think, oh, conjugate acids, you add a proton to it. Okay, if you forget, just write the Ka and Kb expression for something, that'll help. Okay, all right, so uh, do we need to do pH calculations? No, okay. All right, um, so let's do, I don't wanna do that one, I wanna do this one. All right, okay, the table. Because what do we like more? Do we like math or do we like the concepts? Math. I know there's something very beautiful when the numbers all work out feels nice and fuzzy, but here's the thing. All right. What separates the B students from the A students is that the A students know the concepts. All right. They don't just use the tricks. They actually know the underlying concepts that's going on, especially with um, uh, Le Chatelier's principle. Like, yeah, OK, I know. Oh, I add pro I add product. It shifts to the to the reactant side. But why? Why in a rate law level does that happen? Like, yeah, you can memorize the trends, but understanding the underlying concepts is just as important um, as well. So, because <clears throat> what do you think? Our exams are what, like 50-50 math? Yeah, math concepts, yeah. All right, so see, and that was a big struggle for me when I started teaching here because it's easy to write exams when it's all math. It's easy to grade too, but when it's concepts, it's very hard to write uh, exam questions that are not only clear, but to make sure that students are reading it and understanding it correctly. Um, okay, so let's um, use this table to answer the following questions. So what you should see here is we have a table of what? We have a table of acids and their conjugate bases, or you can think of the bases and their conjugate acids. This is the table. So what we see here is that strong acids, if you look at their conjugate bases, they're really crappy bases. Versus if you look at weak acids, if you take a weak acid and look at its conjugate, it's actually a pretty good base. And so if you've gotten to weak acid um, uh, base chemistry, uh, you recognize it's because uh, Ka and Kw for a, or sorry, Ka and Kb for a conjugate acid base pair, they're equal to a constant. And that's why. So the stronger the acid, the crappier the conjugate base. But the stronger the base, the crappier the acid is at being an acid. So let's um, answer these questions of this list. Which one is the strongest acid? So we want to look at which side, the red side or the blue side? Red side, yeah, because those are where the acids are. So just go ahead and cross those off. And so what are we gonna look for? The substance that's what? The highest on the list. So which one is that? HF, HF is the highest on the list. There's HF, there's uh, ammonium, there's water. Perfect. Do you think questions will be like this on the exam? No, we're not done. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, what is the strongest base? So what are we looking at? What side are we looking at? The blue side, perfect. And you're gonna look for what? The substance that's lowest on the list. So which one's that? Um, I need to look, F minus, HS minus, and HPO4, that one. So it's this one, is it that one? Is that what my key says? Hopefully, okay, all right. So, that one's easy enough, right? You look for the substance on the right side. Uh, strongest bases are on the bottom. Strongest acids are on the top. Okay, what substance has the strongest conjugate base? 
So now it's changing. So there's a couple ways you could do this, all right? You could write the conjugate basis for all of these. They, it would be, uh, so if these are acids, you wanna draw out the conjugate basis, it'd be hydroxide, ammonia, and uh, F minus. And you could look for the bases on the base side. You could do that. Or you can use what relationship? If we want the strongest base, we are actually looking for the what kind of acid? Weakest acid. So if we look for the weakest acid here, it will have the strongest conjugate base. All right, so let's do that. So if we're looking for the weakest acid, are we going to look at the red side or the blue side? Red side. So what, what do we have? We got water, we got ammonium, and we got HF. So which one has the strongest conjugate base? Water, yeah. So let me just uh, highlight those conjugate bases. We have hydroxide, ammonia, and F minus. So you see that the weakest acid has the strongest base. It's the lowest on this table, all right? So you could actually answer this question whether I gave you just, I don't actually have to give you the whole table. I could just give you the acid side, all right? And you could still answer it. Okay, um, what substance has the strongest conjugate acid? So what do we wanna look? Are these acids? Nope, these are actually bases. So you wanna look for the what base? Weakest base, yeah. If you look for the weakest base on this list, you'll find the uh, strongest conjugate, uh, conjugate acid. So let's look at that list. So highlight where those are within the base side. So we have F minus, HP, O4, two minus, and then H2S is right there. So we are looking for the weakest base. The strongest conjugate acid is a Minus, right? And that actually fits. I shouldn't have uh, uh, got rid of um, these answers. Look, right? We already said the strongest acid was HF. And so it would make sense that, oh, wait, these don't match. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. Um, all right. And then finally, this last one is the last way we can kind of ask uh, uh, using this table. I'm going to copy this table down here just because it's useful for us. All right. Okay. So we want to predict whether these equilibrium lie to the left or the right. So the strategy here for this question, so note here that there is a acid base reaction happening. If you look at the reactant side, HCl is an acid. I hope you know that. It's called hydrochloric acid. Fluoride is a base. So this is an acid base reaction. I have an acid and a base on the reactant side, but I also have an acid and a base on the product side. Right, so this is my strategy. I always look for the strongest things. Those, that's always the easiest, look for the strongest things. So you wanna inspect the acid on the reactant side, and then tell me, what is the acid on the product side? HF. I look for acids because acids are easy to find because an acid has to have a what? A hydrogen has to have a hydrogen. So what we want to do is compare the strengths of HCl and HF. So based on this table, which is the stronger acid? HCl. You don't even actually need the table to know that because HCl is a strong acid, HF is a weak acid. So to figure out which way this equilibrium lies, understand that the strongest thing always ionizes more, right? HCl is a strong acid. What kind of electrolyte is it? A strong electrolyte, meaning it completely ionizes. Strong bases completely ionize, but do weak acids and weak bases completely ionize? No, so they don't move forward that much. So I like to think HCl completely ionizes and wins versus HF only ionizes a little bit, right? So in this case, that first reaction, the product side is, uh, will dominate um, at equilibrium because you wanna look for the strongest thing, understand that that is what ionizes more. So the products, whatever the opposite side is, uh, that side wins, right? That's how I uh, do it. You can also look at the conjugate bases. We'll also see if you compare F minus to CL minus, F minus is the better base right? And so it's the best thing wins. The best thing wins and pushes to the other side, completely ionizes. That's the idea. So we can do it again over here, but we need to make sure we compare acids to acids and bases to bases, but you really only need to do one, all right? What is the most obvious acid? 
in this equilibrium? HF is an acid. Okay, that means hydroxide is the base. So which one is the acid on the reactant side? It has to be water. It's the only thing with hydrogens. So we are going to compare these acids, water and HF. Which one is more acidic, HF or water? You don't even actually need the table, right? HF, HF is going to be more acidic. So which side of the equilibrium dominates at here? It's going to be the reactant side or the product side? Uh, not product side, it's the reactant side. So since HF is the stronger acid, it pushes more. Stronger things push ionize more in the opposite direction. And so here, uh, the reactant side dominates. I don't, is that what my key says? I hope so. Yes, left, right, okay, perfect. Yeah, so they, those are the, um, the sides. Okay, all right. Um, do we get this chart or is it a, you will have, uh, you will have the chart, yes. But understand that there's many ways we can ask questions with this chart, is how to read it. All right, so um, I have nine minutes left. Is there a question you would like me to do? A number? No, are we good? We good? Okay, then we'll just end there. Best of luck, everyone.